Father, right now we pause before you and we thank you that we have the liberty that we can come and present our prayer request. Father, we thank you for um, the hands that prepared um, the meal that we had a chance to eat this evening. Father, it was just absolutely wonderful. We thank you for, uh, we thank you for, for eating and designing us that, that we can enjoy the foods and the bounty of the harvest that you blessed us with. And Father, we bless you for that. And we thank you for watching over us. Father, we thank you that we have hope of the future with you for eternity. Father, when, when our life here is complete, Father, we think about those that have gone on before us that are waiting on us there and the great reunion that that's going to be. Father, I pray that you'll just help us keep serving and following, championing Christ uh, in everything that we do. Father, watch over us tonight as we open up your word. Um, look at some interesting things, some, some unique things in your word. I pray you'll guide us and direct us. And Father, bless us now in this time when we open your words. In Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, tonight is going to be Enoch, the man, the myth, the legend, right? Um, Enoch is an interesting guy. How many have heard of Enoch? Okay. Well, there's, it's interesting because there's two Enochs in Genesis. The first Enoch is in the line of Cain, and he don't count. The line of Cain disappears from Scripture early on. But in Genesis chapter 5, we have one of the most unique characters. Now, depending on how you look at Elijah and how you understand Elijah, there are two guys in history that didn't have to die. Now, it's interesting that Elijah is a whole other story. We'll cross that bridge one day if we get there. But, but Enoch is a, is a really interesting guy because there's a few things that are said about Enoch. Um, I have some notes because this is going to be all over the place. I have two pages of notes, so I should be done in about 50 minutes. <laughs> 25 minutes of a page. So let's, let's think about Enoch and some things that we can know about him from Scripture. The rest we have to kind of guess at. And then there's some tradition, and there's some myth, and there's a couple books out there with his name on them, um, and we're going to, we're going to just look at, at the whole picture. So... In Genesis chapter 5, verses 21 through 29, it says, When Enoch lived 65 years, he fathered Methuselah. You heard of Methuselah? Yeah. Oldest cat that ever lived, right? Uh, yeah. Enoch walked with God after he fathered Methuselah 300 years. And he had other sons and daughters. I know, phenomenal age, right? Thus, all the days of Enoch were 365 years. That's an interesting number to start with. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. That's how the story of Enoch ends. Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And that's how it explains it. Now, by the time we get to Hebrews, and Hebrews, the faith chapter, talks about Enoch, and it says that he was translated because he had favor in God's eyes. He was pleasing to God. So that's what we know about Enoch. That's the whole story. He's mentioned again in Chronicles. With the line of Adam from Seth, you have Enoch mentioned. He's mentioned just by name. Um, and then just a couple other places. Uh, he's mentioned in the genealogy of Christ. Um, and that's it. That's all there is to Enoch. So, let's have a word of prayer. <laughs> yeah, right. Verse 25 says, When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he fathered Lamech. Are you familiar with Lamech? Methuselah lived after he fathered Lamech, this says 782 years, and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Methuselah were 969, and he died. That's the oldest guy in the Bible. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah. So now you have your timeline in hand. The most important thing about interpreting Scripture and understanding where you're at in the Bible is understand where you are in biblical chronology. So if Noah was just being born, what side of the flood was Enoch? He was before. Antediluvian, we call it. Antediluvian. So he had Noah saying, out of, the, out of the ground what the Lord had cursed, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from our painful toil of hand. So this is the story running up to the flood. Now, if you're familiar with Genesis chapter 5, you know that right on the heels of Genesis chapter 5 is Genesis chapter 6. Now, I got the good crowd here tonight. This is the good crowd. Genesis chapter 6 
starts off with a really strange story about the sons of God and daughters of men. Now, there are a couple, three pro approaches to the sons of God and daughters of men. Well, what's interesting about that is it's right behind Enoch. Now, everybody that came after that. So, God only made one Adam. Amen? He only made one Eve. And all of the rest of the world came from Adam and Eve. That's what Paul tells us in Corinthians, that we all came from one blood. And that there are no races. There are peoples, there are tribes, and there are tongues. But there are no races. There's a human race. Race is a, is a fairly modern invention. And we base it on color more than anything else. But here's what we know. Everybody came from Adam and Eve. All genetics, all skin colors, all hair colors, the presence or absence of hair, all of that comes from Adam and Eve. Well, we can reduce it back down again to Noah. Because we got Noah. We got Miss Noah, right? Because we don't know her name. We have Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And we got Miss Shem, Miss Ham, Miss Japheth. We don't know their names. But from them, that genetic code that they had came from Adam and Eve. And so by the time we get to them, it's still Adam and Eve's genetic code. But we don't know where Shem, Ham, and Japheth's wives came from. We don't know whether they were part of the good group or the bad group. We just simply don't know. But we all go back to Noah. No matter who you run into today, we go back to Noah and his line and for sure from Adam and Eve. So we're way back in time. We're way back when people were living almost a thousand years, according to scripture. I take it at face value. There's a lot of people say that those numbers are symbolic. They're not actual years. I don't have a problem with it being actual years. I don't have a problem with that at all because the world was closer to perfect then than it is now. Amen? So when we look at this, we got this, this mysterious fellow in here, Enoch. And it says, he walked with God and was not, for God took him. Well, Hebrews chapter 11, verses 5 and 6 say, By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death. Interesting statement. I'll tell you why in just a second. Um, he was not, he, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. Well, that's a pretty good addition to the story. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those that seek him. So this is what the writer of Hebrews has to say about Enoch all those years for, ago, that he pleased God. He believed in God. He pleased God. He walked with God. And I love the stories that you'll hear preachers tell or, or teachers tell that God loved to walk with Enoch because Enoch pleased God. He wanted to be with God. He spent time with God. And one day, instead of just turning left to go to Enoch's house, God said, you're coming home with me. And he just took him on home so they can continue their conversation. As sappy as that may sound, that's probably real close to the truth. God took him home. But it's some interesting things about Enoch. First of all, Enoch is the seventh from Adam. Now, if you keep up with Bible numbers, you'll know that word seven is very unique in Scripture. It, it speaks of perfection. It and it speaks of, of God's times of testing. Go look at Matthew's genealogy of Jesus, and you'll have 14 generations, 14 generations, and 14 generations leading up. And you can take a look at those generations, and, and 14 generations is two sevens. I mean, there's a lot of you can do with mathematical numbers. So Enoch is a seventh from Adam. Interesting. Enoch walked with God, and he was translated. On the other side, there's this other cat named Cain. Y'all remember him? Yeah. First murderer, right? Yeah. Cain actually has a son that's seventh from Adam. His name is Lamech. Now, Lamech is the, the guy that said, Cain killed his one, and whoever harmed him, God was going to punish. He also said, I, I have wounded a man, and I have killed a man. And anybody that messes with me is going to be punished 70 times 7, which is interesting because Jesus later said, when Peter said, how many times do I got to forgive somebody? And Jesus said, 70 times 7. It's interesting because Lamech talked about anybody that comes against me will be punished 70 times 7. Jesus came to correct the sins that come from Adam, right? And one of the things he says in his teaching is 70 times 7. So a lot of people have tied those two passages together. I'm not that smart, but I like it. It's neat. Make good preaching, right? Make good preaching. may not be true, but it makes good preaching. So Lamech 
was a killer and a murderer, Lamech also started something else for the first time. He had two wives. He's the first one mentioned in Scripture that had multiple wives, which was obviously not God's design from the beginning. He made, he made Adam and Eve. He didn't make Adam and Eve and, you know, Mathilda and Matilda. and He didn't make a bunch of other people. <laughs> Bessie and Flossie and all the other wives, you know, those old names like they used in the Bible. He made Eve. And she's the mother of all living. So you come down to Lamech, he's seven from Adam, and you have, he's a troublemaker, absolute troublemaker in the line of Cain. And then you have Enoch, who is seven from Adam, and he was so pleasing to the Lord that, and if you go back and read, uh, a little bit later on in a few chapters when it goes back through the, the lineage, it says, and so-and-so lived, had sons and daughters, lived so long, mm -hmm. and he died. So-and-so lived so, so long, had sons and daughters, lived so much longer, and he died. You all remember the curse that God told Adam? In the day that you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And so death has been visiting the human race, it was a part of the curse, right? Death is part of the curse. Enoch did not have to go. He so pleased God. And it, just imagine what that was like. And something else about Enoch. He's the only one that it says that about everybody else. You know, Joseph was a good guy. You know what happened to Joseph? He died. Daniel was a great guy. He died. Enoch, living that close to the curse, seven from Adam, which is an interesting number, so was so pleasing and so pleased with God and so obedient to God that God just took him home. And you would think, well, okay, well, God took him home. He had to die so he could make the trip. But see, then Hebrews clears it up for us. He didn't have to die. He escaped the curse. So Enoch, that's all we know about him. But we know one thing for sure. He absolutely loved the Lord, and the Lord loved him. And he walked with, and the word that's used there is, is Elohim. He walked with Elohim, and he was not. God just took him, took him home. Enoch has been studied and researched and looked into, but here's, here's the thing, here's where it gets interesting. I said I'll go 15 minutes on the Bible, and then 15 minutes on the other stuff. Here's where it gets interesting. There's a book out there that has his name. It's called First Enoch. Have you heard of First Enoch? Yeah. First Enoch is one of those books a lot of people tell you to stay away from because it's got some fabulous, crazy, weird stuff in it. Uh, it talks about the thousand cubit tall giants. It talks about um, the angels of God cohabiting with men. Remember I told you Genesis chapter 6 is right there just after Enoch. And so you, you've got... And so what I want to tell you about First Enoch today is um, it's not Scripture. You all understand me, right? It's not Scripture. It was not considered Scripture by the ancients. It wasn't considered Scripture in, in Jesus' day. But they considered it informative. It's kind of like this. Anybody in here ever read Oswald Chambers? Yeah. yeah. It's not Scripture, though, is it? He uses Scripture, but what he has to say is not Scripture. It's not inspired. It's not like we would consider our canon, the Bible I just set down. That's kind of how they read Enoch. As a matter of fact, the book of Enoch, uh, let me read a few things. Um, oh, where did I? I didn't print it. I'm going to have to make up stuff now. Here it is. I found it. <laughs> and the book of Enoch... The book of Enoch, the, the oldest that we have found it cited or quoted or spoke about is in the second or third century before Jesus. So that's how old this book is. This book is an ancient book. Um, it has been in the Ethiopian Orthodox Bible for well over a millennium, probably more. So there is a Christian church out there. Ethiopian, and they use what's called Coptic, which is a form of Ethiopian Greek. This book, First Enoch, only First Enoch, not Second, Third, or Fourth Enoch. First Enoch is found inside of their Bible and has been since the 600s. Now, the the 
the people that collated the Bible and put it together, by the time year 500 came, they decided this book no longer needed to be in the Bible. It's actually never been received as part of Scripture. So, we read Scripture different than we read other things, right? Here's, here's where Enoch is important. And it is important. And I recommend reading it. Um, you can find free copies of First Enoch online. Second, third, and fourth Enoch, they get a little bit more squarely. They're older. I mean, they're newer. They've showed up. Most of them have showed up. A lot of the writings. They don't know who wrote Enoch. It wasn't Enoch. Because <laughs> it shows up 200 years before Jesus. It's Enoch lived a long time before that. Now, here's the, some of the lore about Enoch. Enoch supposed to be the person who wrote down the language that God used to create the worlds, which is Hebrew, according to the Hebrew people, right? So supposedly Enoch was the one that came up with the written form of the spoken language of God. So he celebrated for that. Is that true? Nobody knows. Uh, modern, the Hebrew, my understanding of, of modern Hebrew that we have now comes from ancient Hebrew, which comes from a more ancient Hebrew, which comes from a Phoenician dialect. So even Hebrew as we know it was broken off of another language. So I, I doubt that Enoch was the one that actually penned the Hebrew language. But he's kind of celebrated that way in some circles. When they dug up, they found those books in this little place called Qumran. Y'all remember that? Do you? 1947? Y'all remember that? 1947, they found the Dead Sea Scrolls. You familiar with that? All right, they got all these different caves in Qumran, and in Cave 4, Q4 is what they call it, they found 11 fragments of Enoch, first Enoch. In those 11 fragments, it's Aramaic. It was the first copy of Enoch they had ever found that was in Aramaic, which is probably the original form it was written in, which is more like Hebrew. The Enoch that we have that the Coptic Church uses is Greek. It's a Greek translation of it. But it's interesting that those fragments line up pretty good with what they have. They were really good at transcribing what was written in it. Now, the people at Qumran, they're called the Essenes by a lot of people. They're a real fundamentalist group. And they had lots of different views, but they were very keen on the end times. They were very keen on the apocalypse. And so they were... They like to collect and have writings that were about the apocalypse. And so they found these writings there, and, and it establishes, first of all, the age of the book, the historicity of the book, and that book, First Enoch, shows up in our book. A lot of people don't know that, but there's a lot of different writings that show up in our book. Remember Paul quoted from the Stoics and the Epicureans at one point? He was quoting from another book. When he was on Mars Hill, he said, you know, as some of your own people have said... And he quotes, he's quoting from another book. It's okay that there's parts of another book in there, but that doesn't make the other book inspired. It just means that that part, when it winds up in our scripture, God is using it for his benefit. Amen? So when we find these other works, and Enoch is one of them, what's interesting is 2 Peter refers to the book of Enoch, and Jude refers to the book of Enoch. Now, the, the book of Enoch, here's what's interesting. The book of Enoch refers to Genesis chapter 6. One of the most major part of it is, first of all, it's very messianic. It was prophetic about what the Messiah should be like. And there wasn't a lot of messianic writings back in that day. Enoch spoke a lot about what the Messiah was going to look like. And so a lot of people that we had, like let's talk about the Pharisees and the Sadducees when Jesus was around and they had these expectations about the Messiah... And you go looking through the Old Testament, you don't really find where these expectations were, but then there was a lot of other writings in their day which made them consider things that way. It's a good example. How many of you in here expect a rapture to happen and expect a rapture to happen before the tribulation? How many? Let me see hands. Come on. There's got to be a few of you. Okay. See, that kind of teaching showed up in about 1830. But that's a long time for us, isn't it? But there wasn't a lot of the rapture before the tribulation teaching before 1830. A guy named Darby kind of made it and molded it into the concept that we have today. And then you come on down the road from 1830s and you got this guy named Tim LaHaye. You've heard of him? Mm -hmm. you got that left behind people. And, and so it's been really adopted. It's been really taught. And on most of our churches, especially churches that are similar to us, 
come at the end times from that eschatological view, the way things are going to end. you got seven-year tribulation, right? Am, am I t talking y'all's language? Seven-year tribulation. you got the Antichrist. you got the beast, the false prophet, and all that stuff that we get from, we get from Revelation. Well, there are four major views of Revelation. That's one of them. And they're all ancient. They go all the way back basically to John when he wrote Revelation. Well, that's the way it was in, in their day. Enoch was a book they used, they read. They didn't consider it wholly writ, but they did consider it informative. Now, it's located, like I said, in, in the um, Ethiopian Orthodox Church, which is Orthodox Catholic. And so it also has the first and second Maccabees. It also has Judith. It has Bell and the Dragon. It has the rest of what we call the apocryphal books, which they're not considered scripture, but they are considered informative. And you can learn a lot from it. Like, if you want to know about the Maccabean Revolt, you're going to go back and look at First and Second Maccabees, and you're going to learn about that revolt, and you'll know that why the political scene was like it was in Christ's day. So these books are, are handy for us. But let me just tell you a few things that are found in First Enoch. Um, Jude, I almost said Jude chapter 4. Um, there's only Jude 14 and Jude 15 says this. And it was also about these that Enoch, and he's talking about, the angels that sin and, and the bad things and the wicked people in the world. That's what Jude's talking about. Jude's an easy read. It's only, I don't know, 20 verses, something like that. And so Jude says it was also about these, these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied. So now he's saying Enoch is a prophesy. He, he prophesied. And this is what Enoch said. Behold, the Lord comes with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment and, and on all and to convict all the ungodly of their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and out of all the harsh things that ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude, which is scripture, right? Jude is part of our holy canon. It's scripture. God breathed. Jude is quoting directly in there from the book of Enoch. Let me read the book of Enoch. Um, Enoch 1, verse 9. And behold, he cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones. Now, Moses mentioned 10,000 of God's holy saints, but it's not worded the same way. This is worded exactly the same way in Enoch. And behold, he cometh with 10,000 of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to destroy all the ungodly and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which, they, which have the, the ungodly have committed. That's verbatim in its original form to what the book of Enoch has. So Jude quotes from the book of Enoch. So Jude was familiar with the book of Enoch. That's what I want you to understand, is the people of Jesus' day were well aware of the book of Enoch and what it said, and they believed that it was accurate. Now, Jude actually says Enoch prophesied this. Now, I've already told you the book of Enoch doesn't show up to the 2nd or 3rd century B.C., so where was it in the meantime if Enoch actually wrote it? Jude says that he prophesied this. Well, there's another tradition out there. You know Enoch's son, Methuselah? He lived a long time, didn't he? If he was able to write, what all could he write? A lot of stuff, right? How many books did Noah have on the ark? Who knows? <laughs> You can't answer that. That was a trick question. Could Noah have had a library on the ark? Supposedly, according to oral tradition, that Methuselah kept all the sayings and the prophecies of Enoch. Now, you ask me, did he? I ain't got a clue. I would never preach that. But, being we're talking about the book of Enoch tonight, I just want to tell you that there are traditions out there that say that all that can be known about Enoch was known by his son, Methuselah, who lived a really long time, almost a thousand years. And just two guys after Methuselah comes Noah. And so if Methuselah was actually able to write some of the traditions and the prophecies of Enoch, who was considered a man of God, Jude calls him a prophet, we're not told that anywhere in Scripture. I read you all the Scripture that there is on Enoch. That's it. We're not told anywhere in the Bible that Enoch was a prophet. So, can I say for sure that Enoch was a prophet? 
The only thing that I can say is that Jude says he was. Jude says he was a prophet. And that he was the seventh from Adam. He nailed it down on who we're talking about. Well, it's interesting. Um, so he quotes from, so Jude quotes from Enoch. Peter quotes, or Peter doesn't quote, but he tells a story that's only found in Enoch. Peter says, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. Right? You familiar with that passage? Yeah. So, let me ask you another question. This is fun. What's a demon? Hmm? We always say fallen angels. I mean, that's just what we've always been taught. Peter says the angels that sinned are locked up. They're not loose. They're not out. They're not about. So, Paul talks about powers, principalities, rulers of the darkness of this age. There's lots of levels out there of, of spirit realm. Let's just leave it at that. Spirit realm. But Jude says the ones that left their first, left the, the angels, Peter says, for the angels, when they sinned, he cast them into chains of gloomy darkness. Well, it's interesting. Enoch says that. In Enoch 54, 1 through 6, that sounds like the Bible, doesn't it? And I looked and turned another part of the earth and saw there a deep valley and a burning fire. And they brought the kings and the mighty and began to cast them into a deep valley. And there, there my eyes, mine eyes saw how they made their instruments, iron chains of immeasurable weight. And I asked the angel of peace who went with me, saying, For whom are these chains being prepared? And he said unto me, These are being prepared for the host of Azazel, which is one of the fallen angels that's mentioned in Enoch, so that they may take them and cast them into the abyss of complete condemnation. And they shall cover their jaws with rough stones, for the Lord of Spirits commanded it. And Michael and Gabriel and Raphael and Phanuel shall take hold of them on that great day and cast them in on that day into the burning furnace, that the Lord of Spirits may take vengeance upon them for their unrighteousness in becoming subject to Satan and leading astray those who dwell on the earth. The only reference that we have to angels being locked in chains in the abyss that Peter mentions is right here in Enoch. There wasn't a lot of other books that were written that we're aware of there are a lot of books that are quoted in the bible that we don't have anymore but the book of enoch mentions that the chain the angels that fell are going to be locked in these chains and cast in another place in enoch it says they're going to be cast in there for 70 generations and then be turned loose again but that's enoch can you quote that can you preach that no but that's what enoch says what i want you to understand is that peter and jude both knew the book of Enoch and they used the teaching of Enoch in what we call our Bible today. So is the book of Enoch important? No. You're scared, aren't you? No, it's important. It's important. If it was important enough for the people in Jesus' day to read and understand, and people say, well, why do I need to know it? Everything I need to know is in that book. Amen. That's exactly correct. Everything you need to know is in that book. But in our attempt at understanding that book, we need to get ourselves into the mind of a first century Hebrew, don't we? Mm -hmm. And if we can read what they read, and we can understand what was going on in their world, we also understand why they said what they said. Like, anybody ever read that passage in Jude before and said, what's he talking about? Mm -hmm. Something else uh, the book of Enoch goes on and talks about um, in um, Second Peter no, Jude 6. Jude 6. I read 2 Peter. Jude 6 says this. And the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of that great day. So Jude says the same thing about the chains and the gloomy darkness that Enoch says and that 1 Peter quotes. So 1 Peter, 2 Peter, he's referring to a writing that's not in our scripture. Now, it has been included in the Bible before, but it was never included as scripture. It was kind of like, anybody here ever seen the original King James? The original King James from 1611, in the middle of it, it had the Apocrypha. You can still buy it today. Cambridge still publishes one that has the Apocrypha in the middle of it. Now, a lot of people today, especially Protestants, say, I don't go by the Apocrypha books because they are not, they're not in the King James. Well, they used to be. They were. 
All the apocryphal books used to be in the middle of the King James. Now, apocryphal does not mean scripture. It means probably good for history, but not necessarily good for total accuracy. There are some apocryphal books that refer to Nebuchadnezzar, and they were written thousands of years after Nebuchadnezzar. They have nothing to do with Nebuchadnezzar, but they use pseudograms. They used other people's names to get the books read. So there's a lot of books like that out there. Enoch is one of these books. Now, Enoch is also totally famous today, the writings of Enoch, because it teaches about what's called the Watchers. Have you ever heard of the Watchers? The Watchers are the angels or the beings, let's put it that way, the beings that God placed over the world to watch over the different people groups and to teach the different people groups about him. They didn't do it. They wanted worship for their self. Um, if Genesis 6, depending on how you interpret it, they went after strange flesh, which is what Jude says. They left their first abode. They went after strange flesh. On down in Jude, and it compares those angels that fell to Sodom and Gomorrah when, when the men in Sodom and Gomorrah wanted to rape the angels. So it's kind of comparing the two very similar at that, at that place, that they wanted to rape the angels, and the angels wanted to rape the women. Now, if you can believe that or not, no skin off my back, but a lot of people lean that way, and they get this teaching from, like Peter, and they also get it from Jude, they also get it from the book of Enoch, and, and then there's a lot of crazy stuff out there. And you may be thinking what I'm saying right now is crazy, but it gets weirder, and I'm not going to get into the weirdness of it tonight, um, but have you ever heard people name off a bunch of angels, like Raphael? Yeah, you get that from like the book of Enoch. See, there are two angels named in Scripture. He's a, yeah, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, he's also one of the Three Stooges. No, not, I mean, the Three Musketeers. Wasn't there a Raphael in there? So, but there are a lot of people that name these angels, and what they get these names from is some of the ancient writings that these people knew over 2,000 years ago. These angels had been named for a long time. Our scripture that we have mentions too, Gabriel, Michael, and that's it. And Michael is called the archangel, by the way. Because I know a lot of people say that Gabriel's an archangel, Michael's an archangel, and Lucifer was an archangel. But we don't know that because Michael is called the archangel. Usually the, the word the means one, the only one. Um, Michael's also referred to as the prince of the people, God's people, which is Israel. So you can kind of see the teaching that these angels, these beings were giving authority. You remember when Gabriel was on his way to talk to Daniel? And as he was on his way, he was withheld by the prince of Persia, which is a being of some form who, was, who has authority over Persia. And he withheld Gabriel for 21 days. Now, I don't know what your theology is like. But a lot of us think when God says something, it happens, right? Well, God sent Gabriel and it took 21 days. Why? Because the angels or the beings have free will to fight with one another. Did, did God's will get done? Yes, it did. But it did take 21 days. When I read that the first time and realized, wait a minute, God sent Gabriel? And before he could get to Daniel, this prince over Persia stopped him? And he couldn't even prevail over the prince of Persia because of the power and the might of the prince of Persia that Michael had to come, which is the prince of Israel, he had to come and fight against this prince of Persia so Gabriel could get loose and go talk. And that's right there in Daniel. Daniel explains it just like that. And then when Gabriel gives the message, he goes back. He said, i got to go back now. i got to fight that prince of Persia. So he had to go back and finish the war that was started. So there's still this supernatural battle going on in the cosmos. Most of us aren't even aware of it, but there's been writings about these things throughout history. Another... Um, section of scripture that's interesting is um, Psalm 82. Psalm 82, let me just read it. I'm going to see if there's a different translation in there. Psalm 82 kind of refers to this angelic council. Psalm 82 actually calls it the council of gods, which is confusing to us. Because when I say God, what comes to mind? Yahweh, right? Yeah. He's called Yahweh in Scripture. 
but a lot of beings are called God. Because the word Elohim is the word we translate God. Yahweh is a very unique Elohim. Psalm 82. I just want to tell you what it, what it says. And some of you, I want to see if anybody has a different translation. Because sometimes they, the translations are a little bit funny because it's easier to understand. Psalm 82. A psalm of Asaph. God has taken his place in the divine council. Okay? In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Anybody got something different than that? In the against, uh, midst of the rulers. Yeah. It's interesting because the word there is Elohim. So it's interesting because it says Elohim has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the Elohim, he holds judgment. It's not talking about the Trinity. He says, how long will you judge unjustly? So he's talking to other Elohim. Not equal with him. He's the only Yahweh, the creator. He made these other Elohim. And show partiality to the wicked. Give justice to the weak and the fatherless. Maintain the right of the afflicted and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They, they walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. I said, you are gods. Does anybody's translation have that, verse 6? Okay. You are gods, Little plural. G. Huh? Little g. Little g. Yeah. Elohim. You are, Elohim is a plural word in Hebrew, by the way. Anything that ends in im is plural. So Elohim means powerful, multiplied. Um, and when you go back to Genesis 1, it says, In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth, referring to the creator God. But he's also got a council by that point. Anyway, and this will be new for a lot of y'all, and I hope you're, you're springing parts of your brain. I want you to research it. Verse 6, I said, you are gods, sons of the Most High, all of you. Now, anywhere in the Old Testament, when it says sons of God, it is always referring to Elohim. Always. Not one place is it not. Even when it says in Job, when, when God created the worlds and the sons of God rejoiced for joy. He's not talking about humans. Because none of us were around when he created the worlds. Only the Elohim were. They were already created. They were already part of a council. But he says, you are gods, sons of the most high God. Right? All of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. You hear there's a curse in there. God's, these creatures that he has created, they're not in his image. They're Elohim. The word Elohim means... Supernatural. It just means, it can mean spirit, it can mean demon, it can mean angel, it can mean cherubim, it can mean seraphim, it can mean, mean zensavim, I forget the other word. But there's all these different creatures that are mentioned in scripture, but they're all Elohim. Our God is Elohim. He's the only Elohim, though, that's Yahweh. Does that make sense? He's the creator of all of these other supernatural beings. So he tells these Elohim that he is created. He said, I said that you are Elohim, sons of the Most High, which only refers to God. There's only one Most High. He's the High Elohim, and his name is Yahweh. He says, you're sons of the Most High, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die. Why would he say that if he was talking to men? He's not talking to men. He's talking to Elohim, and he just told them, you will die. You will die. You will be locked up in chains. You will be locked up in the eternal flames and all that, and fall like any prince. Then we have, arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. Now let me ask you something. God's going to inherit all the nations. Whose are they to start with? They're all God's. But then at some point, Deuteronomy chapter 32, God gives the nations to Elohim to rule. And they become princes, they become authorities, they become rulers, they become powers, they become dominions. And the whole job that they had is the same job Israel had, and that's point to God. And you know what that is? Point to themselves. They wanted the worship of the people. Now, Enoch is an interesting book because Enoch talks about the fall of humans 
how the Elohim, follow names of where you're going to say, taught people how to do magic, taught people how to use the sun, the moon, the stars, taught people how to make potions and curse people. And all. I don't know if any of that's true. But I do know that there's some interesting scripture that most of us are unaware of because a lot of times preachers are either unaware of it or they're afraid to take Psalm 82 and tell you what it actually means. Now, you can look up in a lot of commentaries and they're going to tell you that the sons of the Most High are the leaders in Israel. But it can't be because the leaders in Israel were going to die like men anyway, right? God sits in a divine council. How many of you have never heard of a divine council before? You're afraid to raise your hand, aren't you? Just two of you? Okay. I remember when I stumbled across the divine council teaching of Psalm 82. I remember reading that going, okay, who's he talking to and who's talking? So I ran to the commentaries because that's what we do. And they explained it all the way. God's talking to the leaders of Israel. But he's not. He's sitting in a divine council. He's talking to other Elohim. And the translation will hide that word Elohim in there for you. Humans are never called Elohim. But God, Elohim, sat in the council of the Elohim. We're never called Elohim. We're not Elohim. We're in God's image. You know what that makes us? Above the Elohim. Think about that. We're in God's image. Any other created be creature out there, being, whatever you want to call it, the power, the immense power, the knowledge, and everything that they have, when we die and we're in God's presence and we spend eternity with him, we are above them. That's why the Bible says that we will judge angels. We're going to judge angels. What does that mean? We're going to rule over and judge angels. Anybody ever thought about that and thought, you know, I'm not ready? <laughs> I haven't been through the training to judge angels. Amen? Amen. Scary. The Bible says that. I've actually taught that and I had somebody... Not rebuke me, but rebuff me. And they said, I just want to chill out when I get to heaven. <laughs> I don't want any more responsibility. I, I, and, and there were tears involved. They said, I just don't want heaven to be that. And I'm like, well, I'm sorry, but the Bible says heaven's going to be exactly that. We're not floating around on clouds playing a harp. <laughs> and cherubim are not little babies with an arrow. They're terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. But they are another form of Elohim. Anyway, other books that are lost now also are mentioned in Scripture. Um, the, uh, the early Christian writer, Origen, a lot of you have heard of him. Ale he was an Alexandrian Christian. An early Christian scholar and theologian mentions the book, The Assumption of Moses. Anybody ever heard of The Assumption of Moses? Right. Okay. <laughs> It was evidently extant or around in his day because he was talking about the book that they could go get called the, the Assumption of Moses. In the Assumption of Moses, it tells the account of Michael rebuking Satan for the body of Moses. And we find that in the end of the New Testament. It says, but Michael didn't bring a railing accusation. He just said, the Lord rebuke you. Because Satan... And Michael, both Elohim, both have their roles. Satan has been kind of become the, the, the ruler of the dead since he got men to fall. And Jesus came and rescued the dead from the ruler of the dead. And so Moses was a dead man. And so, you know, Satan's like, he belongs to me. He's now in the realm of death. God said, I'll tell you what to do, Michael. Go get Moses' body. And so Moses, go, I mean, Mo, uh, Michael goes down into Satan's territory and says, um, the Most High sent me to get that body. And Satan said, you can't have that body, it belongs to me. He's dead. He belongs to me. And Michael said, the Lord rebuke you. You know where that comes from? It comes from the book called The Assumption of Moses. It also is in our scriptures. That's not recorded in the Old Testament. It's not recorded in Deuteronomy. It's not recorded in any of that. But it made it into our scripture. So don't be afraid of these other books. Do what? Oh. And that's what Jude 9 says, by the way. But when the archangel Michael, contending for, with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume or pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, 
the Lord rebuke you. Interesting? So, I recommend the book of Enoch. Not like it's the Bible. Because there's some crazy stuff in there that I left out tonight. But there's some interesting things that wind up in our scripture. Yes, ma'am. It kind of, yeah, Joseph Smith has a tie to it. Um, but Joseph Smith lied about a lot of stuff. Yeah. He actually had the Egyptian Book of the Dead that the angel Moroni showed up and helped him interpret with these special glasses. And he said it was God's writing, it was a special book, and he had these special glasses. Well, stupidly, they kept the book, and then some scholars come along later and said, That's Egyptian, it's the Book of the Dead. It's a famous book in Egypt, the Egyptian Book of the Dead. That's what he had, and it doesn't say anything like he said it said. So he was a liar from the get-go, power and influence. But the books of our Bible have changed. Yes. Yes, they have. The Bible, the Bible that we have today... Yeah. Right. Yes. And who was the leader of the church. Yeah. And even what's contained in some of those books. Um, when, when King James, you know, asked those scholars to do the translation, and they were running along and they were taking a Greek word and translating it, taking a Greek word and translating, they got the word baptizo. The, word, the Greek word baptizo means to dunk or immerse, to dye cloth. And they're like, you know, King James is sprinkled. If we tear apart his own baptism here, he'll tear our heads loose from our shoulders. So they did what the Bible translators before them did. They translated, they transliterated the word bapt, baptizo to Americanized or Englishized baptize. The, the word baptize means to dunk or to dip or to hide. But there were so many people that were being sprinkled at that time. They said, how are we going to explain that all these baptisms don't line up with Scripture? And it became a point, so what do we do? We just leave it baptized, baptizo, and we argue about it. We argue about what it means to baptize. Is it to effuse, to pour? Is it to sprinkle? Is it to dunk? Is it to dunk three times? <laughs> Father, Son, Holy Spirit. I got a good one for you. There's this group called Three Times Forward Dunkard Brethren. That's the denomination. They would three times forward dunkered brethren. It's part of the brethren movement. I don't even know if they exist anymore. But if you want to get baptized, in, if you want to be in their church, you had to be rebaptized, no matter where you came from. Then you went forward in the pool. Three times forward. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost. We can't get along on baptism. Have y'all heard of the Jesus only people? They don't baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Because what's the name of the Father? What's the name of the Son? What's the name of the Holy Ghost? His name is Jesus. They baptize you in the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus only. So when they put you under and pull you back up, you're baptized in the name of Jesus. Now, I had that run into me. My formula for baptism is I baptize you now, my brother, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I go back and I bring you back up. That's my typical formula. Well, I had a guy show up for his granddaughter's baptism at another church. He was a Jesus-only guy. He would not have ever believed that her baptism counted if I baptized her in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. So what I do? I baptize her in Jesus' name. Did it work the same? It worked the same. The formula doesn't matter. Doesn't matter at all. Baptism doesn't do anything but let everybody else know that Jesus lives on the inside. Amen? It's an outward show of inward grace is a good way to say it. Anyway, we were way off topic. The thief on the cross was not baptized. Was not baptized. No. Yep. But that day, depending on where you put the comma, he was with Jesus. He was right. In paradise. Yep. yep. That comma's funny, too, because Jesus either said, I tell you, this day, I tell you, comma, this day, you will be with me in paradise, instantaneously, which is what I believe, or you move the comma. And what day is it? 
and I will tell you, I will tell you this day, okay, comma, I'm telling you right now, you'll be with me in paradise. Whatever point that happens. So people argue about where to put that comma. And, and I got news for you. There's no comma in the Greek. <laughs> exactly right. Yep. Yes, sir. I think a lot of people get rebaptized because they evaluate later on in life and they think, you know, I, I really don't know that what I did, I did as a believer. I think I just got baptized because my friend got baptized or I'm not sure that I was actually a believer at the time. Um, then a lot of people have come to me and said, I've, I've, I've been born again, I've been baptized, but I have lived like the devil. And I want to rededicate my life and I'd like to start it off with baptism again. And I, I'll say, fine, come on. So I think a lot of people just do it as a new start in life. Any other? No, this is still good. A question I brought in here that if Enoch lived before the flood, yes. how do we have his writings if they weren't on the ark? Right. Unless he told them to, unless Methuselah wrote them down or memorized them. Now, most of the Bible that we have is oral tradition. Yeah, all of the Old Testament's oral tradition. Yeah. Well, it's oral tradition, even including the gospel writers, because mm -hmm. what Luke say? He said, I sat down and I talked to the primary players uh -huh. and I got a rendition of what actually happened and I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. So Luke got the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. But compare that, if you want to get to something closer, with the American Indians. I mean, there are many cultures whose stories are passed Yes. They're never written. You're exactly right, brother. And the story is so important that it's story time. Right. It's memorized. It's, memorized. it's given back. And they, make, they critique it. They make sure it's accurate. And so by the time it is written down, it's, it's the story that's been told. Right. Yeah. For us, it's like our ancestors. You know, I repeat the stories that mom told me, that grandma told mm -hmm. her. Yeah. You know, like she spoke these things about your past. That's right. So your family that's been handed. Yeah, because if we don't do that memory work, we know how our mind gets a little bit later in life. We can't remember what we had for breakfast, much less what color the house we lived in was. But yeah, see, and here's another thing. Let's go back and let's assume Moses wrote Genesis because that's most of the teaching. Moses wrote Genesis way after the flood. Wait, so even if Noah had a library and it was pinned down and rewritten and pinned down and rewritten because, you know, books don't last, especially if they're used. By the time we get to Moses, we've gone a long time from Noah. So I lean into, I don't have a problem there being books on the ark. Um, I'm not sure how much was actually written back in that day at all. Um, you know, they wrote on stone tablets. It just seems a bad idea to bring a bunch of extra stones on a boat. <laughs> The library section of the ark sank it, right? It was heavy enough with all the elephants. Yeah, <laughs> they balanced with the elephants. Yeah. Six or seven hundred years until the saints were over and over again. Yeah. That's right. And they didn't have a whole lot of other distractions. No. And something a lot of people don't think about go to Adam, right? You got Adam, his. His Cain killed Abel, then you have Seth, right? Lamech overlaps Seth. So there's a chance that Lamech, Noah's father, sat on the lap of Seth and was told the stories. They knew one another. They not only knew of, when we talk about somebody that lived 900 years ago, you can't just walk down the road and talk to them. But in this day, you can say, well, my, my, my daddy was, was born 800 years ago, and I'm 759 right now, but let's walk over and see daddy. I mean, it's a whole different world. The stories not only were handed down, but you still had some of the originators to critique it. Seth could say, no, Lamech, you're telling that wrong. I mean, it, it really is kind of phenomenal when you think about the overlap, and it's all part of God's plan. So that we can sit here today and say, I have faith and I have confidence in that book that we call God's Word. Mm -hmm. I, have, I don't have faith and confidence in First Enoch. Interesting reading. 
But I'm the same way about First and Second Maccabee. It's, it's great reading. If you want to know the historical conflict of the Maccabean revolt, you'll find it right there. Then Josephus. Sometimes you can trust him, sometimes you can't. Listen, Josephus was a Jew. He was totally against the Romans until he was hiding out in Qumran and the Romans were on top of the cliff and they were throwing these big, huge treble hooks way out and they would swing back in these caves and they'd hook a Jew and pull him out. And they'd pull him out and they'd fall down the cliff and die. Josephus is back on these caves and he hollered, ho, 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 wait, wait, I'm a Roman now. <laughs> so Josephus flips and then it becomes a Roman historian. He writes about the history of the Jews, but he writes it for Rome. Can you trust him? <laughs> cool story though, right? Yeah. The Romans knew how to get you. They'd get you out of a cave with a flesh hook. Anyway. <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. Tie him up to a pole and threaten to set him on fire. You might get the truth out of him. Anyway, we've gone a long time. Any other thoughts? No? Well, we've prayed, we've eat, we've studied the word, we've studied some heresy. It's been fun. <laughs> You're dismissed. God bless you. <laughs>